I'd like to welcome all y'all this morning. My name is Bud Giesinger. I'm the president of the Tri-Cities chapter of NACD, and it's, it's great to see so many people out this morning, and it's, it's amazing how when you bring these headliners in like we have this morning, the, uh, everybody seems to not hit the snooze button and show up for breakfast. Well, we've got an outstanding breakfast this morning. We're real excited about it. Uh, I just want to take a minute to give you a little bit of background about Bill Giles, and then I'll have Bill and Greg come up, and, and Bill will, will do the same for Greg. But, you know, everybody, most of y'all, I don't need to introduce Bill. Uh, everybody just about in town knows him, and he's the helicopter man. But, uh, but I'll tell you, there's a, the old adage of starting at the bottom and starting on the floor. Well, Bill literally did that um, with Western Oceanic in the, on the drilling floor of a rig uh, off the coast of Scotland, and that's how he got started in the, in the drilling business. You can't go much lower than that, and he started and worked his way up. He even got promoted to Derek Mann, and then he was a driller, so uh, he could tell he was a fast riser. But no, Bill has had a, a great career. Uh, prior to uh, running Bristow for over 10 years, uh, he was heavily involved in the drilling business, um, being a founder of Child's Offshore Drilling and sold that. And um, then he would start another one. He also founded Southwestern Corporation. And then he, he liked the name so much, Child's. He did another Child's too. And um, he sold that. And uh, then he spent some time uh, as an executive with various companies in the drilling business before going to Bristow and deciding he would try his hand flying helicopters around the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico and all over the world. But we're real excited to have Bill this morning. Uh, Bill is a graduate of UT, uh, got his uh, master's at SMU. Uh, as, as I say, he's been a long-time long -time citizen of Houston and lives here with his wife and their five children. So, Bill, if you and Greg want to come up, y'all can get started. Great to see all of you again. A lot of friends out there. Uh, I don't think I need to introduce Greg, and you have his bio in your, in your seat on your table, uh, but I'll tell you my, my personal uh, relationship. Greg and I have known each other for, well, I guess since you arrived in Houston in the mid-90s. Uh, when, he, when he joined Continental, and I, I kind of watched what he was doing at Continental, uh, actually, worst to first should have been your book. So, uh, But I admired him so much, and I was so interested in aviation that I wanted to be like Greg, so I, I, I saw the leadership. I could see from afar, the leadership, um, the, the level five servant leadership that he, uh, he, he, that he followed, and it, it was pretty amazing. So, uh, I, I, again, I'm, I'm not going to give you his background because you've got it in your seat. So, why don't we get started, Greg, uh, and first, tell us about your family. Yeah, no, uh, you know, just a, a first a call out. I have some, uh, some of Baker Hughes' directors are in here, so thanks for coming. I know Bill's here, and I have maybe a couple others as well. Uh, uh, and then uh, some of my ex-Continental colleagues are, are here as well. So uh, great to see you again after, after all these years. It's always great to be in uh, Houston on a Friday, so that's a good sign for me. My <laughs> wife, uh, Rhonda, uh, and I have been married for uh, 33 years. So she says it's been the best two years of her life because I've grown <laughs> so much. So uh, uh, I, uh, Rhonda and I uh, have been in Houston since the mid-90s, since 1994, uh, when I came down actually to join Gordon Bethune at, uh, at Continental. And Gordon had just arrived about nine months earlier. Um, and uh, some of you were around during that time. And uh, from the 94 to the early 2000s, we really uh, executed that uh, the turnaround of Co Continental. Uh, I raised my three kids here. We actually have lived in the woodlands the whole time which meant that I got to drive a lot, right, to come down, uh, come down uh, to Houston. Uh, uh, when we moved here, uh, Rhonda knew somebody in the woodlands and actually went up there house hunting and decided that's where she wanted to be. And uh, it, it, I don't know how your house works, but our house works. If mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So we were, we've been in the woodlands ever since. Uh, and uh, I have three kids we raised there. Uh, Andrew is 28 and is married uh, to Nina. And uh, they're here in Houston. Andrew works at Bain. Uh, Bethany, my daughter, like the rose between two thorns, uh, is, uh, is actually a speech pathologist in Denver uh, at a Health South Hospital there. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able to dynamite her out of Denver. I've been working on it, but uh, I don't know. It seems like all the young kids love to be in Denver. You, you've yeah, got, I've got you one got, daughter. You've got one in Denver, daughter, too. too. And uh, then my youngest son, Aaron, uh, is uh, Bethany's 26, is 24. And he actually is up in the Woodlands. He works at the Woodlands United Methodist Church, uh, 
which as a um, uh, AV uh, person, so he'd be running the sound and lighting and all that kind of stuff. He went to Asbury and got his degree in that, and, uh, and uh, it's a big church, and they keep him, that pretty much operates 24-7. They keep him really busy over there. So they're all, good. they've all found God's purpose for their life, and they're Very all good. doing great. And, awesome. Uh, Rhonda and I uh, had, you know, developed a saying that happiness is when the, well, I, I actually did, and she doesn't correct me too often. Happiness is when the kids leave and the dog dies. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're, I can we're, having a great, we're having a great time being empty nesters. Uh, yeah. uh, and, but uh, but it's, it's, been a, it's been good. We actually loved our dog, but it just so happened we got our dog like 15 years before the last kid left. So the whole thing timed out pretty yeah. good. <laughs> great. Well, I can relate to that. We're, we're, we're empty nesters as well, but we have three dogs and a cat left. Yeah. So, uh, we have our... our we have our, our days full of taking care of those dogs. And, uh, Greg, in your book, you talk a lot about culture and how important culture is in, in the success or failure of a company. So as a, as a director, how, how do you know when, uh, when something's going wrong or the, you've got a culture that needs to change and what do you do about it? No, it's a great question. There's probably a tip or two in here, you know, in what I'm about to say. I got back last night from the Home Depot annual meeting. I'm on the Home Depot board. Uh, it was my 17th annual meeting as a director. I'm the lead director there now. And, uh, and so I've seen a lot of transition there. I was actually the only, the only director left that was on the board. I went on the board when I was 38, but, but I uh, w was there when the founders were there. So we still have three founders of Home Depot that are alive. You see them on CNBC sometimes. Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank, who owns the Falcons, and Kenny Langone. <laughs> Uh, and uh, they always were very outspoken as they, as they worked their way into their 80s. That, that actually increases, believe it or not. That governor comes off and, and they're, really, uh, they're really pretty entertaining uh, and still very vibrant. In fact, Arthur was at the annual meeting uh, of the shareholders yesterday. And they actually set a culture in Home Depot that was really profound. And they had two very simple things they referred to. One was the inverted pyramid which actually starts with customers on the top and then associates and then store managers and then you know corporate staff you know store support center is what we call it and then the CEO and they really kind of live that value and then a values wheel that was basically what you do for the associates what you do for the community and it could kind of be summed up Bernie basically always said if uh, we take care of our associates the 400,000 orange blooded uh, Home Depot associates, they'll take care of the customers and the rest will take care of itself. And the company was really built on that cultural foundation, so much so that there are these famous stories of customer service where somebody was really upset and brought a tire back in you know, to Home Depot because it's their tire on their car went bad and wanted a refund. And uh, the associate actually refunded the cost of the tire. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, Home Depot doesn't sell tires. Uh, uh, so, so, so you know, there's a uh, you know, there's a real kind of culture a, there. But we lost that somewhat, uh, and it just goes to show how important leadership is. Uh, we lost that uh, in the in the mid 2000s. You know, early to the mid 2000s, uh, we had a CEO who uh, who really did not truly embrace. Uh, that culture and started letting go of the skilled plumbers and electricians who were helping people with their jobs, started reducing the labor in the stores, really shifted the mix from full-time to part-time pretty dramatically, you know, to more part-time workers. And, and uh, you know, really from a, a customer service perspective, we lost our way. Initially, the metrics of that were great, right? Because the cost was coming down and, the, and uh, and, uh, and uh, profits were going up, but, uh, but you know, the, the market realized very quickly that the company was getting gutted, and uh, we had to make a change. So a couple of us led a change in, uh, a couple of dire as directors, a couple of us kind of led the board uh, to, to make a change in the 2006 time frame. And what allowed us to do that was something I'd actually suggest you do for all your boards. So forever since I came on the board at Home Depot initially we, the requirement was you had to visit 20 stores a year so basically five stores a quarter you'd go in you'd walk the store you would talk to the associates you would go to the break room you would find out what was going on and then you know you'd either initially write a report back but then as the lawyers got a hold of everything you started verbally doing that so that there weren't too many reports <laughs> hanging around um, uh, and uh, and that was really great because you got a bead on the company over time we kind of morphed that a little bit, and, uh, and, and one of the things I, I morphed it to after a little while was actually every quarter one of the senior team members 
comes around to each director and you spend a half a day together. So once a quarter, half a day with each senior team member and you'll go into the stores and, and walk stores if you want to. You might sit down with their team and get an update on what they're doing. But uh, So every director actually over the course of about two or three years has actually spent a lot of time with each team member. What that allowed us to do in that 06 time frame is another director and I went to the Northeast to meet with the Northeast Division. And we sat down with the management team in the Northeast Division and it was really clear that they had disconnected completely from the store support center from corporate headquarters in Atlanta. That they were doing what they needed to do to satisfy customers because the crap they were getting out of corporate was, you know, they were being measured on like 300 and some odd metrics in every store. I mean, it was impossible, right? It was like, uh, you, know, uh, you know, measurement on steroids. And, uh, and you just couldn't do, do it. So they had adapted and that was kind of pretty clear to us. But what really struck us at, uh, was when we had a session, and we did this and every time we went to go do this, we actually had a session with the high potentials. So those were high potential store managers, district managers, regional managers, people actually working for a living. And uh, we had this little <laughs> cocktail hour with them and uh, they came in and the first, the first guy raises his hand. So he said, what do you guys have on your mind? Tell us. First guy raises his hand and, he's, and the first guy, the guy said, when are you going to fire the CEO? And I'm like, wow, that's pretty, Ooh, that's pretty aggressive. Strong. Usually it's like, hey, you know, uh, you know, our break rooms need upgrading or something, you know, or, you know, hey, uh, we got a vendor we're having a problem with. I mean, you're used to those kinds of questions. And uh, second person raised his hand and said, when are you going to fire the CEO? Third person, when are you going to fire the CEO? I said, well, I guess we're going to talk about the CEO. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had a conversation there, but what, but what became really clear is from the bottom up that uh, everybody knew this change needed to happen. And uh, what the lesson I think in that is, is if you can actually set up on, when you're on a board to not only understand the culture, but to spend time every quarter uh, in the organization with people that uh, you can kind of get unfiltered feedback from, right? And we've, we've all got our company examples of doing that. I could tell you 15 more. But uh, that is actually the feedback that allowed us strategically to understand how much the culture was being undermined and that we were going to lose the company if mm -hmm. we didn't make a change. You know, the story goes on, we made a change. We actually put in a CEO by the name of Frank Blake. Yeah. Some of you know Frank. Bonnie Hill has been here to speak. Some of you may have heard Bonnie. Bonnie was the lead director at Home Depot before I was, and we were on the board 15 years together, so Bonnie could have shared some of these stories. Frank was just an amazing servant leader. I mean, one of the best I've ever seen. Every Sunday, or I call Frank every Saturday, he'd be in his office at Home Depot, and he spent every Saturday, and he would write 200 thank you notes every Saturday, handwritten. Uh, to people that helped him out. And these are associates that maybe did something nice in the stores, but it also involved, you know, even people you normally wouldn't think would get a thank you note, like bankers and stuff, right? So, so uh, uh, I was with Jamie Diamond one day, and we were just talking, it was at his office in, at J.P. Morgan. Uh, Jamie Diamond's the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, and, uh, and uh, we were just sitting and talking, we're good friends, and uh, we were talking about this thank you note thing, and uh, Frank writing these thank you notes. He went to his office, how many of you have a drawer in your office that you know, has thank you notes that people have sent you? If you don't, you're lying. Yeah. Uh, 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 because it's so rare, right, that we actually kind of get thanked. And uh, Jamie went to this drawer in his office and opened it up and pulled out two thank you notes that Frank had written him for something J.P. Morgan had done for Home Depot. But that's the kind of servant leader we were able to transition to. We brought back the skilled plumbers and electricians at the time when the you know, when the market was on its, its tail in 08, 09, we actually, uh, we did not, you know, take a single cut at Home Depot. We kept the 401ks in place. We kept the merit pay increases in place. We really invested back in the associates at a time when, uh, you know, when the world was really tough in housing. Tough anyway, really tough in consumer durables and housing. And that paid massive dividends. So the stock since then has gone from 20 to, I think it's, you can Google it, it's 155 or something. Uh, today and uh, it's probably wow. one of the very best run companies in America but that was all kind of coming back to the to the culture, culture. and and you know uh, the previous CEO had actually you know really the founders were almost a threat to him because they were mm -hmm. so popular and uh, so he really pushed them pushed them off and uh, one of the first things Frank did which was very powerful is uh, 
is brought Bernie Marcus back to the store managers oh, yeah. meeting, and uh, you know, people wow. were just crying, you know, at, uh, at the stores when that happened. When he came back. Yeah, when he came back. Well, now that since we're on this subject, um, oh, I, I love the quote by Peter Drucker that uh, you know, uh, culture eats strategy for lunch. Yeah. So it kind of goes in. It's in line with what you're saying. So while we're on this subject, uh, talk about you, you're clearly a level five servant leader. Mm -hmm. And I think we'd like to understand, how do you define level five servant leadership? Yeah, I'm not sure what the and levels 20 are, words actually, or less or yeah, less. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but uh, no, I think it's actually, uh, I think for all of us, right, it's, it's actually, uh, um, you know, really understanding and putting ourselves in somebody else's shoes and understanding what their, you know, what their needs are, what their desires are, and being really open to opening up the feedback. You know, one of the things we did early on at, at Continental, and, and this is uh, done at Depot and everything as well, is uh, we, we actually would talk and take emails and calls uh, from, the, uh, from the employees directly. So we, every, at every level of our, uh, of our management team, we had to replace a lot of managers initially because this wasn't their mindset, right? So we started with 61 officers at Continental, and uh, and we uh, departed 50 uh, of the 61, uh, you know, either because, you know, I say there's really two tests. There's the, dip, the oil dipstick test, where if you put the dipstick in, it comes out two quarts empty. Uh, you know, there's not much you can do. And then there's, would you want to sit next to this person and fly, fly, fly across the Atlantic with them kind of test. And we actually brought, uh, you know, brought uh, 20 really talented people in and then some more people after that that really understood, you know, what it meant to listen to employees. And we went as far as we set up a hotline, a 1-800 hotline, where if anybody saw anything wrong on the system, they could call that hotline. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and at 8.30 every morning, we had a meeting uh, represented by all the groups, you know, mainly ops groups, pilots, uh, mechanics, flight attendants, gate agents. We reviewed every one of those, and then we fixed it. Uh, we didn't fix it, but had a good reason not to fix it, or we needed some time to study it. And we always, within 24 hours, got back to the employee that had sent it in you know, to make that uh, mm -hmm. comment. My, my voicemail would be loaded with pilot and flight attendant. Uh, you know, at the time, voicemail was more prevalent than email to sort of dates it. But email the same at, at Depot today. I mean, I have associates email me all the time at Home Depot from the stores. But, but uh, 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 at voicemail, and you could always tell if it was a pilot voicemail because it would basically be quick. It would be, I'm at Gate 93 in Newark. The, uh, this is the third time I've been to Gate 93 this week. The shortest amount of time it's taken for a gate driver to get the, the gateway to the plane uh, when we taxi in is, uh, is 12 minutes this week. Can you fix this? And click, right? That was it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was a pilot. And in a flight attendant, it would start with, you know, where they were born, how old they were. <laughs> and they had like a three-minute timer on these messages. So you'd be on like message five, right? You know, well, now what's the issue? I, I'd really like to know what the problem is. But, 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 uh, but anyway, that was, uh, that, that was, but just get, being able to, willing to listen and get back to people, even if they don't, you don't act on, mm -hmm. you don't agree with the request or, or what they act on. Well, what's powerful. extraordinary about that, you have to have a very secure management team yeah. to, to create the trust. Yeah where people will feel safe to do, to actually get on the hotline. To say that, yeah. yeah. To get yeah. on a hotline or, you know, in the case of, uh, it tells you how, uh, how safe the uh, Home Depot associates felt where three of them in a row could ask when you were going to fire the CEO. That's, yeah, I mean, that, yeah, they're, 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 they're pretty, uh, they feel pretty they you had, secure. You, you in, guys had their back. Yeah, in their, yeah. Uh, in their, in their uh, status. This, this may be a rhetorical question, but how, how important uh, is it for, the team to, to develop their vision, their mission, core values, and a strategy that everybody can understand yeah. all the way down the line to the shop floor. It, one of the things you'll see in the book, you know, that I've just discovered over the course of my career, both in my business life and my personal life, actually, is there's a lot of power in having a one-page plan. We started kind of doing these at, at Bain. We do them for, I'm, in the, I'm on the dark side now. I'm in the private equity business and run a private equity firm. But, but uh, uh, but for every business we buy, the first thing we do, I ask everybody to do, is take out a sheet of paper and across the top write market, financial, product, and people. And then write the five or seven, you know, no more than three or four things in each category. But what are the key levers that you do in order to fix the business, essentially, or improve it? And lots of times, you'll look at that sheet of paper and you won't be able to write you know, what it is you do. There's a lot of times when people would say, hey, would you come run this company? And I'd sit down with a blank sheet of paper write those four things across the top and say, I have no idea what to do. 
Absolutely none. I'm not the right person to run that company. Might not be the right person to own the company either, right? Uh, but uh, uh, every business I have, and, and Home Depot is great at this, uh, Baker, you know, getting great at this is, and you know, at Continental, the folks that are here from Continental, they'll remember the four things. The market plan was fly to win. The financial plan was fund the future. The, the product plan was make reliability a reality. And the people plan was working together. And you know, just to kind of give you an example under the market plan, under fly to win, the fastest way to make money is stop doing things that lose it. That's really actually, uh, that's really apparent in the oil and gas industry. I know a lot of you are in the oil and gas industry. Uh, 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 and uh, you know, just to stay with the airline for a second, I remember you know, when I first got there, I said, could somebody give me the route profitability of each route? And uh, so they did, and 18% uh, of the flying was cash flow negative. It wasn't covering the cost of the food, the fuels, the crews, the aircraft rent. So we just asked a simple question was, uh, when, you know, why do we fly from Greensboro to Greenville eight times a day when both people, are on, you know, both people that want to go are on the first flight? And, uh, and uh, they'd say, well, somebody in marketing would say, that's strategic, right? <laughs> And I'd say, well, when did it ever make money? And they'd say, well, it never has. And I'd say, you know, how strategic could that possibly be? And couldn't we just charter a Learjet to get you and your girlfriend there? It'd be a lot cheaper, right, than, uh, than flying these eight flights a day. And so we did a very counterintuitive thing and actually shut down that 18% of the flying. And then we degaged the airline. So where seven fours where we put triple sevens, where triple sevens where we put seven sixes, where sixes where we put seven fives, or seven fives where we put seven threes. All of a sudden the planes were full, we could raise price. So it, it, uh, it, but in the oil and gas industry, it's really interesting because everybody's got that, you know, you, everybody's got an engineer they've squirreled away that's working on this little field um, and for sometimes for many years that's away from the core of what they're doing. And, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, right. maybe it produces oil at $70 a barrel well, or something. It, 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 in line with what you were just saying, yeah. there's a, I think there's a quote in the book, Worst, Worst to First, yeah. about you guys, I think both of you were in a meeting in, let's call it Alice, Kentucky. Yeah. And all of the team was talking about why, why we fly here, why, but the planes were flying a third full. Yeah. So either you or Gordon said, I got a great idea. Why don't we fly where people want to go? Yeah, yeah. Is that a true story? Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Uh, um, you know, we figured if we actually flew to uh, people w where they wanted to go and got them there on time with their underwear, served them good food <laughs> when they're hungry, and showed them movies when they're bored, did that 2,200 times a day, you know, yeah, we'd be in pretty good. good, we'd be in pretty good shape, right? You know, yeah. so, um, but having that one page plan is really critical and actually thinking of ways, and it's harder than you think, pull out a piece of paper on your own business, try and do it, but then try and actually make it a little catchy so people will remember it, right? Because what you're really after is everybody in your organization remembering it so you can, you can execute on it. And the one thing the really great businesses do, you know, Home Depot has kind of done this in spades, is everybody knows what the strategy is. Mm -hmm. Everybody yep. knows what's important. And in fact, every annual meeting for the 17 years I've been on the board, the first slide that goes up is the inver inverted pyramid and the value wheel. And every associate in the, in the whole company, all 400,000 people, can tell you exactly what they're supposed to do. Right. And that's really powerful. And we had that uh, you know, at Continental as well. And we did it at Burger King, too. It was interesting. We had, uh, we had uh, uh, sort of trying to figure out what the customers wanted. You know, have it your way was the Burger King thing. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, uh, and we found out that, uh, you know, just to give you an example, we had a hot and, a hot and fresh fast and friendly and clean and safe, right? For the restaurants, the kind of three things we were working on. And on Hot and Fresh, we found that every minute a Whopper sat on the heat chute. You know, they had those heat chutes at lunchtime where they just dump them on there so they could go fast, uh, that uh, it would lose 10 degrees, right? Well, the Whopper comes out at 160 degrees. By the time five minutes goes by, it's 110 degrees. A uh, Whopper at 110 degrees is a really different burger than 160 <laughs> degrees. And so we actually got rid of all the heat chutes and actually redid the ovens that had been in there, the boilers that had, had flame broiled them, had been in there for like 50 years so that we could actually make everything to order, which kind of fit with the have it your way theme. So it's usually kind of in retrospect, you say, well, gosh, why wouldn't have somebody done that a long time ago? But it's thinking of your own business differently, simplifying it, taking the complex and making it simple, thinking of a catchy way to explain it. Um, uh, in market, financial product, and people, it's really powerful. And you know, one thing I do as a director, and, and this is probably helpful uh, maybe to some of you, is for the boards I'm on, I also kind of draw out that 
that one pager and say, okay, you know, how are we, you know, how, how would I explain this business? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and that's actually a really insightful thing. I find some of the times, I have a lot of questions to ask after I try and do that, right? <laughs> to sort of figure out why are we doing this or you know, what are we doing here? And sometimes it's just I don't understand, so it's good for me. But a lot of times, you know, being a new director is a great thing because you can ask every dumb question and get away with it, right? So it's really powerful if you come on a board fresh to really help the board take a fresh look at that. That's great. That strategy. That's great. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna. Uh, we've got a question from from the audience, okay. and, I, and this this you 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 expected this question. I did. You knew it was okay. coming up. So, uh, what are your thoughts on the United Culture? What needs to change? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've been away from the airline business for a long, long time. So, uh, uh, thank God. Um, uh, but, but uh, uh, you know, just my own perspective on, on United, and, and uh, they've, they've got a lot to do, right, to get the culture, the culture done right. But let me kind of give you one example, and then, and then, you know, I could talk a little bit. United would have been a different airline had the merger happened and headquarters been in Houston, Texas. Because the management team in Houston, um, and there's a long story behind that, but uh, you had Obama in the White House at the time, and, and you know, Chicago guy, and, and so it was going to end up there. But that, that mill management culture in United, for as long as I've been in business, back to my, you know, probably 30 years at least that I can remember, has been really difficult. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, that's been tough. But the one kind of example I'd give you, and I noticed this, and I don't know how many of you did during this whole last incident on the dragging the guy off the airplane thing, um, uh, they actually started talking about the rule book at United, and uh, they talked about how they have this rule book uh, that's really long and, you know, that the gate agents and everybody's supposed to follow and people didn't follow some of the rules and everything. You know, I remember when we got to Continental, uh, basically Continental had that same kind of rule book and we go out to talk to the gate agents at the airport and um, basically they'd say, I'd say, why are you doing that? And they'd say, well, this, that's the rule. I said, do you have a book? You know, you have a book of these rules? And they, they brought out this book that was like an epistle, right? And it turned out that for years and years, every time somebody did something wrong, somebody would write a thou shalt not rule, right? And that kind of was the nature and the basis of this really thick book for here's how you handle customer service. And so uh, what I would actually suggest United do is take their rule book and get a 55-gallon drum and a gallon of kerosene and go to the top of the parking garage in, uh, in, uh, <laughs> in, uh, in Chicago at O'Hara and uh, you know, put the book in the 55-gallon drum, put the kerosene on the book and light the whole thing on fire and just sit down with everybody and get two pages that you know, say, hey, we really want you to take care of the customer and here's some ground rules. And there's so much IT now that you can exception manage that stuff. So if somebody upgrades somebody 20 times in a row, you know they're just sending their friends and family on vacation, right? And you can go and snap their underwear or whatever. But, but, uh, but, but, but you know, you, you, so you, but you never really need to do too much of that, right? You do that once or twice, it's like a public hanging. Everybody kind of goes in line. But 99% of the people, I guarantee you, at United want to do the right thing. And they're sort of locked in by this culture and by this, this set of rules. And I, I think they could do some really symbolic things to uh, uh, you know, make a big difference there in a short period of time. I think they're trying, but uh, it ain't working. So, Thanks. Yeah. Okay, this goes along with our, our discussion about culture. So this, this is actually an interesting question. Not too long ago, someone sitting on the same stage said, culture is not the board's business, quote unquote. Should the board be a culture shaper? Uh, yeah, I think the board has to be. If I, I'll tell you what we did at lunchtime yesterday at the Home Depot board meeting, and this is really interesting, and this might be another takeaway for your boards. Uh, we actually had the legal team come in and our general counsel and do a little bit of role playing around what happened at Wells Fargo. Because the Wells Fargo incident is 100% culture, and it was 100% detectable by the board. 100% detectable by the board. Let me just give you some numbers. The board had, you, we all have these whistleblower hotlines at these companies, right, that people call. The board had 7,000 whistleblower complaints on the uh, sales practices at Wells Fargo. 7,000 whistle, this all came out in their little investigation, right? 7,000 whistleblower complaints on the whistleblower hotline, uh, you know, that came out of that. Uh, the, the stated motto in their annual report was to sell eight Wells Fargo products 
to every adult in the United States. Eight. Can you imagine having eight, like whatever, you know, credit cards or whatever in your Wells Fargo credit cards in your uh, wallet? Um, the, uh, the, the, the definition of a good account, right, a new sort of startup account was $100 was in the account for 30 days, at least 30 days. And that if you had 90% of the accounts met that threshold, that was a good result, right? You had actually a good result. Well, think about that. $100 in the account for 30 days, fees coming out of the other account, and you could have 10% bad accounts with that definition, right? So culture is really a board. I mean, that's where the board needs to check in. And, and you know, I think they all got reelected by like a skin of their teeth or whatever. The board did, but that's, that's a culture. And Wells is, by the way, a great bank and was a widely renowned bank for whatever, who everybody wanted to copy, right? I mean, it wasn't, this wasn't a terrible bank or a terrible company. Uh, and what they had is an autocratic leader that sat in that organization. And, uh, you know, I, I just wonder if the board would have been visiting with those branches and would have quarterly kind of met with people and, you know, would have been required to go spend time in the field if they hadn't have discovered that a lot earlier because it was obvious there were at least 7,000 disgruntled people and we all know for every person that calls the hotline there's got to be a hundred more that are oh, in yeah, the same sure. you know situation so uh, uh, you know I think culture and strategy really if you have a really well-run company what the board ought to really be worried about is culture and strategy right? I Market totally strategy. agree in your book you talk about the five steps to turning around a company yeah. would you describe those steps? Yeah, sure. It, just really quickly, uh, these actually, this is the paradigm I use whether I'm, uh, uh, whether I was trying to figure out whether to take a CEO job or not, whether I was actually on a board and actually looking at the board, whether I was uh, trying to buy, a, if I want to buy a stock, I actually apply these company, these five steps to the stocks to see how, you know, that I, of the, com the companies of the stocks I'm looking to buy to see how. So this is actually kind of pretty useful. Uh, across all, but and it's pretty intuitive, really. One, the first step is have a plan and track your progress. So back to the one-page plan, the four cornerstones, uh, really nailing it to a page so you know what the key value levers are. And I use it to actually understand really what is a company trying to achieve, right? You know what? You know what are we really trying to do to serve customers, society, yada yada yada. The second step is build a fortress balance sheet. And the, uh, this is really a great step if you're in the energy industry, right? Because you can survive a lot of dips in commodity prices if you have a fortress balance sheet. I actually learned the fortress balance sheet term from Jamie Diamond at J.P. Morgan Chase. So in the fall of 08, I actually went in to see Jamie just to catch up uh, one morning at about 9 o'clock. And I walked into his office. And uh, Jamie is this dapper guy. Any of those of you who have seen him on TV or maybe he's been here to speak, I don't know. Um, and, you know, he's always really buttoned up. Uh, and uh, he had his sleeves rolled up, his tie undone, his hair was messed up. And I said, Jamie, you don't look so good. And he said, uh, thanks, Greg. Uh, and uh, and, and he, uh, he basically, I said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to get out of here. He said, well, no, 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 I've canceled all my meetings these days. I just wait for Hank Paulson to call and tell me what business I got to buy. And I said, well, how, how can you, you know, how can you be sort of, how can you manage through this, uh, you know, this process, right? And he said, Greg, I got a fortress balance sheet. I said, take me through that. And he actually walked me through in about four minutes the balance sheet of J.P. Morgan Chase. And he had actually memorized kind of where a trillion plus dollar bank, right? He, he had memorized kind of how they had protected each piece of the balance sheet so that they'd be OK, even in a third standard deviation crisis. And so uh, you know, build a fortress balance sheet. And if you're in a cyclical industry, that's doubly important, right? Because yeah. if, you, you know, if you don't have your assets matching your liabilities, or if you're in a growth business and you just simply are growing like mad, but you run out of cash along the way because working capital eats you up, both of those are deadly. So you've know, you got to figure yeah, that it's out. It's like drowning in six inches of water. It is, yeah. yeah. You could drown in six inches or 600 feet. At Continental, we were pretty close to drowning in about 600 feet of water. <laughs> but uh, in some ways, that was actually helpful. Uh, and then the third thing is think money uh, in, not money out. So everybody tries to save their way to prosperity. You really have to step back and say, what can I do to actually add incremental value to the customer to actually grow revenue? Because you get $5 of market capitalization from a, prof, a dollar profit that comes from revenue growth compared to a dollar profit that comes right. from cost reduction. Mm -hmm. So revenue is, uh, you know, growth is kind of next to godliness and a bunch of stories on, uh, on that, but, uh, but I'll, I'll keep moving here. 
Uh, the, the next one is build a team, clean house if necessary. So the one thing I do is after I draw that one page plan of here's what the plan looks like and here's what the company's doing, I then take out another blank sheet of paper and I say what would be the ideal structure of the management team and what skill sets would be needed to get A players against the A problems to actually execute on the plan. That's an interesting exercise and not thinking about the team you have today but just, just, just laying that out. And what I find is in really good and well-run companies, take a company like a Home Depot, for example, you'll have about an 80% match between here's what we're trying to get done and here's the team and how they're allocated, right? And you're constantly tweaking that to try and get that as close to 100% as you can. It's a constant process. In a company that's really crappy, that match might be only 20% you might just not have the people. The sled dogs that drove you into the ditch might not be able to pull you out. And uh, in that case, you need to treat people with dignity and respect, but deal with the issue and, and move on. And uh, that happens more than you, you, know, you sort of imagine. So that's it. And then after you have a plan, you have a fortress balance sheet, you've thought about how to generate revenue, and, uh, and you've built the team that you need, uh, uh, the last one is let the inmates run the asylum. <laughs> so it's at Home Depot, mm -hmm. it's empowering those 400,000 uh, orange-blooded associates to serve customers yeah. and giving them the tools that they need and, and really focusing on you know, that inverted pyramid on, on them. At an airline, it would be making sure the gate agents can uh, you know, take care of the customers when they have issues, making sure that the pilots know it's their airline and you know, when the plane's loaded and they're ready to go, they can take off. Um, it, you know, it varies by business, but uh, but you're, what you're really trying to do is empower folks to execute that one-page plan so that you can just go home and watch TV. Great idea, great plan. So in your, in your book, you talk about execution of the, of the five steps. Right, what is it, right away, all at all once much, and yeah. right away? Yeah. And that's kind of a, that's a little bit frightening for a lot of people. Uh, would you expand on that, and, and how does the board involved in that process? Yeah, no, the, the, uh, uh, the right away and all at once is interesting, and that came out of really two things. Uh, um, uh, I wrote this, the, w the reason the book came about was uh, I'd written this Harvard Business Review article on the Continental Turnaround. I got a call from Susie Wetlofer, and Susie was the editor of the Harvard Business Review. She had been with me at Bain, and then with me at, uh, at, at, well, with me at HBS, and then with me at Bain. Before she came to Bain, she was actually a romance novelist and a reporter for the uh, Miami Herald. And so she ended up going and becoming the editor of the Harvard Business Review. She's now Susie Welsh, by the way, Jack Welsh's yeah. wife. But, but, uh, but uh, Susie called me and she said, Greg, we have to write an article together about how this Continental thing happened. And I said, we really don't, actually. It's, uh, it's actually fine. I'm doing, I'm doing okay. You're doing okay. Let's like, leave this alone. <laughs> And uh, she said, no, no, no. She said, write something up and send it to me, and it won't take long. So I wrote something up. I don't know. It took a few hours and, uh, and said what we did and sent it to her. And I got this thing back that I didn't even recognize, right? It was so much better. She's a fantastic writer. And, uh, and uh, you know, and, and uh, so then she called me, and I said, Susie, this is unbelievable. Uh, and she said, yeah, no, I told you we should write this article. I said, you really wrote this article, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, uh, and, uh, and so we talked about what to call it. And she said, well, Greg, what is the most important thing? Let's start with that. And I said, we've got to do them all. And so we ended up with right away and all at once, how to save Continental. So after that, after doing a few more of these turnarounds pretty successfully, I, I kept getting a call calls that say, would you write a book, would you write a book? And I never really wanted to write a book. It, that actually felt like a resume virtue, to be honest, you know, with you, you know, honest to you. It's like the stuff that you read, like on the sheet that you got in front of you about me. You know, it's what, you know, people read when, before they introduce you to come speak or something. David Brooks has a book called The Road to Character, uh, New York Times. Uh, I don't read much about the New York Times. This is a great book, though. And he, he talks about uh, the virtues and, and characteristics. And he talks about uh, resume virtues and eulogy virtues. So resume virtues are the sheet you got. Eulogy virtues, what would you want somebody to read at your funeral? And so finally, publishers kept calling. And I said, well, the only way I'd write the book is if I could do the five steps of business and the five steps of life, right, back to back, and actually pay tribute to my mentors you know, at the end of each chapter. And they said, fine. So that's how the, that's how the book came about. But uh, the right away and all at once thing in business is really true when you sort of look at those things and you say, which is the most important? They all are, right? You've got to kind of do them all at one time. And, uh, and uh, that's, that, that's, 
that's really important to do is to speed is velocity right. is 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 really important it's it's next to godliness so well i had I, in my experience you know holding on to people too long is, yeah. is a ter- every time I, I i made that mistake mm-hmm. i regretted it and once i made the decision to, to make the move yeah i thought what was i thinking yeah and everybody was sitting around in the company saying what what's he doing what, you know what, what took him so long so yeah in the private equity business that's really we have half of our partners are operators like myself and half of them are traditional private equity guys so 50 50 on every deal we have that that's how we manage the deal on and running the company that's how we run the firm right it's myself and tim walsh who's one of my partners who is a traditional deal guy and the one thing that operators bring to the deal guys in spades is a willingness to move much quicker on management decisions. Private equity guys are famous for, yeah, I know. Well, it'll get better I'm, I'm, next quarter, it'll get better the next quarter, it'll get better the next I'm, quarter. I'm better in my private equity You're life too, yeah, at that yeah, 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 so it's, it's really that kind of courage to, you know, yeah. And actually, it's always better for the person you're talking to, too, at the end of the day. Oh, at the end of the know, day, yeah, better, yeah, there's no it question. Might, for 10 minutes, it might be a little tough. But yeah. after that, it, they just get, get to continue with something that they're really going to be good at. And, and um, so I, I totally agree okay. with you. Um, as you obviously know, because you're here, Houston's been through probably the worst downturn we've, we've seen in the history of the, of the oil and gas business, yeah. energy business. What... Uh, what advice would you give to CEOs and boards about the kind of behavior and the things they should do to work through these yeah. severe downturns? Yeah, it's 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 interesting uh, in uh, in energy and maybe I just talk uh, uh, E and P and then services because they're a little they're a little different. Uh, you know, in commodity businesses or cyclical businesses, you want to actually variableize your cost structure at the lowest level, at, you know, or fix it at the lowest level that you can imagine and then variableize it above that. So I think these five steps actually work pretty well. If you kind of work through what is, what is the plan, uh, there's nothing like a downturn to really ask yourself, you know, what things really do make money? What markets should I be in? What unique value am I adding? Um, because we all know as prices start creeping back, everybody comes back like a bunch of drunken sailors. So mm-hmm. you better have, you, you know, you better have a basis set in terms of what you're really, really good at, right? The balance sheet is a huge issue. Uh, you know, most of the time when you get in trouble in commodity businesses is in good times, it looks like a great return on capital to borrow money at 3% or 4% or 5%. And then, uh, you know, get, uh, and then sort of, you think you can get a 15 or 20% return. I've actually learned looking at E&P that whatever they say the return on those wells is, just set, subtract five to 7% and you probably are gonna be pretty close. Um, uh, uh, it's a pretty optimistic crowd. But you, you really need to sort of then sort of commodity price test that and commodity price test your balance sheet, yeah. you know, in terms, of, in terms of thinking about that. A lot of people made a lot of money during this time by actually coring up assets in the, in the Permian and the scoop stack in e and and then actually really focusing on, uh, uh, you know, driving down production costs and turning it from a sort of a uh, artistic model of let's drill each well differently to a production model. And that whole business is turning into it, production. It's, it's amazing, by the way, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I say that oil and gas guys are like the disciples of biblical times. You know, four of the disciples were fishermen. Uh, and, uh, you know, oil and gas, it's kind of drop a line and pray, you know, same thing. Um, but uh, what's really been amazing is what this group has actually done for the world. I mean, if you sort of think about uh, the ability and the technology curve, we all followed Moore's Law in the semiconductor industry. That looks pedestrian relative to what you guys have done on fracking. I mean, if you look at a frack five or seven years ago and you look at a frack now, and the increased production of that and what low cost energy has done for our country. Imagine just 10 years ago, we were, George Mitchell was one of my mentors and he was the guy that really invented fracking. But, it, you know, and I talked to George about this before he passed away. I said, you know, imagine the world change of actually the U.S. becoming not only energy independent, but an energy exporter. And all the sort of geopolitical stuff that we were dealing with only five or seven years ago that are, is just much different today in terms of how that gets handled. It's been, what you guys have done has been quite frankly amazing, you know. I think on the services side, you know, uh, a bunch of us here, you know, are uh, in the services business or have been on the board of services companies. It really is, uh, it's funny because if you're in the services business, you tend to think I need to be everywhere for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think that assumption you need to challenge, you know, in terms of 
how you think about it, because if you, you know, sort of take geographies on one axis, and there's about 100 countries, and by the way, it seems like every country that produces oil is like, uh, you know, people like to fight, right? So, I mean, it's like an unrest, you know, it's not, it's not a peaceful place where a lot of this oil comes from. And then you go down the other axis on the products you offer, and you say, what's the 10-year NPV of each of those boxes, right? I mean, if you sort of looked at how much am I going to make over two cycles, uh, you know, in, you know, uh, you know, where I, in countries like Iraq or places like that where every two years I have to pull out because somebody's like threatening to bomb me and kill me, um, and I have to pull all my equipment and people out of there. I think it's really, it's really great to challenge, like, where do I want to be and how do I want to be there? Do I want to be there in a full service model with my own employees or maybe I'm better off just selling equipment too. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's one absolutely. of the things our, you know, the board at, at Baker was really pretty good about sort of starting to think yeah. through. Good. So I have a, a couple of good questions from the audience. Every question in the audience is a good question. <laughs> uh, okay. Who influenced you to discover your purpose and in paren, do you have a mentor and what, how did they influence you? Yeah, it's a great question. So I'm going to tell you a story of who that person mainly was. But in the book, you'll find I've been really blessed to have some amazing mentors. And the back of every chapter in that book is actually a page or two on them and sort of what they did for me and taught me about the sort of point of that chapter. So uh, I think every one of us needs a Paul and a Timothy, right? Somebody to mentor us and somebody we can mentor. That's kind of my view of life. Probably one of the earliest mentors I had that was one of the most powerful was my uncle Lyle Yost. Uh, my uncle Lyle was a uh, was born in the era. Uh, he passed away three years ago at 99, but he was born in the era where if you and you saw pictures of this when you were harvesting hay. I grew up on a farm in Kansas, so when you were harvesting hay, and I grew up Mennonite, so I have Amish relatives, the horse and buggy folks. Uh, you would actually take a pitchfork out. Uh, that's that thing with the five prongs that you know you can stick people with. And uh, you'd, you'd throw the loose hay onto the back of a wagon. So it was very labor intensive. And uh, so he actually looked at that process and he said, I'll bet I could mechanize this. So he said, my purpose in life is to mechanize things for the farmers. So he invented the hay bale. Oh, and then wow. he invented those round bales and the big square bales, right? Because he thought it would be really great if a farmer could bale a field by himself without additional help. And uh, then the other thing he had to do as a kid, he had to crawl in the back of a combine and at wheat harvest time and actually take a grain shovel and, and shovel grain into the truck. And uh, he thought that was pretty laborious and not great work. So he invented the auger that took uh, grain from the combine and dumped it in the truck. So you'll see the augers hanging off the side Amazing. of combines. They're used for a lot of other things now. Um, and he turned that into a Fortune 500 company. Wow and uh, called Heston Corporation. I grew up in Heston, Kansas. Uh, and uh, and uh, he actually was this uh, crazy guy. So that was his purpose in life, is to mechanize things for the farmers. And then I would talk to him and I'd say, Uncle Lyle, what, what, you know, what's, your, you know, what's your real purpose in life? He said, well, my, my mission in life was to mechanize things for the farmers. He said, Greg, my purpose in life is to give away all my money before I die. So I thought, well, that's really interesting. So um, he, uh, he, uh, he taught himself how to fly. He, uh, basically, we lived 30 miles from Wichita, where Gates and Cessna and Learjet were, so he, all, they were all his buddies. And you know, he taught himself how to fly. He flew down to Latin America. And uh, he noticed this one Mennonite community down there was just brutally poor in Central America. And he uh, came back to the church, and he said, hey, I'd like to actually give, start a dairy down there. We can employ a lot of people. They need the protein, and, and uh, it would be great. And so the church looked at him like he was on drugs. And, uh, and so he bought up all the used dairy equipment in our area, packed it up, and shipped it down there. It's still the largest dairy in Latin America today. So he started what, this what dairy a, down there. So he was story. just an incredible yeah. guy. But, but it kind of went beyond that. So my grandma, who was his little sister, she passed away at 95. She had a stroke. Uh, and, uh, and she passed away about two years before he passed away. And uh, uh, she had a stroke, and uh, he was still like in '99 playing golf every day, walking, you know. And you know, he fortunately, went very fast. But, but, uh, and uh, he knew that she had gone to the hospital a couple of days before with this stroke, and she passed away about five o'clock in the morning. And he said, uh, he, he, his daughter uh, Susan, actually, who had come into his room. Uh, a year earlier and said, Dad, you know you had this mission to give all your money away before you die. And he said, yes, Susan, I know that. She said, you succeeded and you're still alive. Uh, but by 97, he had managed to give all his money away, which was pretty cool. 
but uh, just back, back to others. Uh, he built the Aspen Chapel. If you go to Aspen, Colorado, you'll see the Aspen Chapel oh, yeah, there. Sure. It's dedicated yep. to my grandfather, who was a Mennonite bishop, and my uncle, who was a Mennonite bishop. But anyway, there's another story there. But anyway, so she walks into his room to tell him that his little sister's passed away. My grandma passed away about 5 in the morning. She walks in there about 7 in the morning, and he, he said, Hey, Susan, I have something I want to tell you. And she said, What, Dad? And he said, uh, Zella, you know, it's just his, my grandma, his sister, went to heaven. And then she said, Dad, how did you know? And he said, well, about five in the morning, she came and sat here, and we had a nice little chat. And then she, she said, I'm ready to go be with Jesus, and she went. And uh, so that's the kind of lineage I you know, came from. So I had some pretty good mentors. Yeah, yeah in terms what, what, of that, you know, mentor, a, mentors in life, yeah. Which actually kind of raised the bar in terms of like, you know, making you feel guilty a little bit, too, because yeah. they were pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah. Well, this, uh, this, uh, this is also a good question and has to do with your family. Please share your thoughts on maintaining a work and personal balance. Yeah, it's, that's an interesting one. Um, uh, so I, for a long time, would try and balance work and life, right? And uh, like I, I started with, uh, you know, Rhonda and I have been married 33 years, and she said it's been the best two years of her life, so I'll let you be the judge. of. You re she really needs to answer this question, uh, uh, judge of that. So, but... Uh, I always felt like when I was at work, I should probably be spending more time at home. Uh, and uh, we did a lot of fun things early in our marriage. We started a little school, a couple of you have come up and, and have kids there, uh, called the Woodlands Christian Academy in the Woodlands, Texas, which now has, I don't know, six or 800 kids, something like that. Pretty cool school. And you know, we, we, did, we did a lot of things together as a, uh, as a family. And uh, you know, pretty early on, my kids and Rhonda pinned me down to go into church every Sunday night and doing this program called the WANAs, Approved Workmen Are Not Ashamed, out of Second Timothy, which is a scripture memory games and Bible story program for little kids. I did that for 10 years every Sunday night. I hated every minute of that, by the way. <laughs> uh, I'm just not naturally on the floor with little kids is not my like, uh, you know, sort of favorite thing. Um, uh, but, 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 uh, uh, but, you know, so I, I tried, but every time I was at work, I'd feel guilty about, you know, maybe I ought to be doing more at home, which was most of the time. And every time I was at home, I was certainly thinking about work. Uh, do you, any of you have that problem when you're at home? Yeah. Um, uh, I'm kidding. Yeah. The, the, uh, uh, and so I actually, uh, about 10 years ago, when I actually finished running Burger King and came back, I said, you know, I thought about my Uncle Lyle and some others, and I, I said, I'm satisfactorily underperforming pretty seriously here. And so I said, I wonder if I could take these five steps that, for business and actually flip them around on life and use it to turn around me. And an interesting idea. So I actually did that. I wrote a one-page plan for my life. I carry it with me everywhere I go. And, uh, and uh, you know, so the other half of the book, but the more interesting half by far is the five steps for your life, and, and those are a lot of fun. I got a lot of fun stories around that. But one of the things I discovered in that process is if I was going to try and balance my work in my life, I was never probably going to feel too satisfied. So what I started trying to do was integrate work and life and uh, really doing them both at the same time. And I'll just give you one quick example of that. And I could give you more uh, about other people, what other people have done with this, uh, which is really powerful. But um, one of the things I thought is, uh, as a family, about a decade ago, we started sending out 600 books at Christmas time. Uh, to CEOs and board members that I knew and, and folks like that. And we'd pick a book that was secular but had a faith kind of theme in it, some sort of deeper value-based theme. And we'd send it out, and about 300 of the 600 would get read. You know, that's, I got 10 years of rough data on this. And of those 300 that would get read, I'd get 150 emails that say, you know, because these are pretty busy, lonely people, right? You know, they, they would say, hey, I got something I really, I've got a problem in my life, or I got something I really want to talk about. Could we have breakfast, lunch, or dinner? So as I travel around now, every year I have about 150 of those meetings with uh, CEOs or, or board members or other friends or, or whatever. But that was just one way I could actually integrate my business and my life. So I was in Europe last week. I was in six cities in four days or something like that, and I did 12 of those uh, in Europe. So it, it's, it's, that to me is real, you know, that starts feeling like I got my business and my life kind of in order. So my encouragement would be don't think about how you balance the two. Unless you're really better than I am, that's really a miserable kind of way to end up because I never really felt too satisfied. <clears throat> if you can think about how to integrate them, it's a lot more powerful. That's great. Great yeah. Uh, are there any more questions from the audience? Because I've got one more, and then we're kind of, I guess we're ahead of schedule a little bit. No, no, no more questions? You can, I guess you can raise your hand if you want to, if it's mm -hmm. not 
a bad question. Okay, last for me. Uh, Greg, tell us something about yourself that we don't, we don't know. No, oh, no, huh. Uh, I won an Emmy Award. Really? Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah, it, but it was like, if your kids ever got those, uh, I think they're the most ridiculous things. My kids got a ton of them, those participation awards, right? They didn't really do anything. That's what this was. Uh, uh, so I've got this buddy by the name of Eric Weinemeyer. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of Eric's name or know Eric. Eric has climbed all seven summits. Uh, he's kayaked the Grand Canyon. He's paraglided. Uh, he skis with me twice every year. We mountain bike together, and he's blind. Oh, yeah. uh, and, uh, and so he's, a, he's, a, he's an incredible speaker, but he's a relatively famous guy. Uh, and, um, and, uh, uh, and so uh, Eric, uh, you know, having done a lot of different things with Eric, and he's been on a lot of TV programs and all this, I was having dinner with a friend of mine in New York that I hadn't seen for about 15 years by the name of Fran Healy. And Fran was the catcher for the Yankees. He was Reggie Jackson's roommate at the Yankees, the catcher for the Yankees and Orioles. He became a Hall of Fame broadcaster. Anyway, I said, Fran, what are you doing? I haven't caught up with you for a long time. He said, I'm doing this program called Fox 365. And I said, what's that? And he said, uh, have you heard of ESPN 30 for 30? I said, of course. And he said, that's the Fox version of that. And so he was telling me about you know, interviewing. He'd been down here interviewing uh, George Foreman and uh, and uh, he'd interviewed Roger Stahlbach, Nolan Ryan. He'd just do these little segments. And so I said, Fran, um, I got an idea for you. He said, what's that? I said, let's go for a walk. This was after dinner in New York. I said, where do you want to walk? Because he loves, he's 70 years old, but he's in impeccable shape. I said, let's, j let's just go down by Times Square. And I said, he said, why Times Square? There's too many people there. And I said, no, nah, I want to show you something. So anyway, in Times Square, there was this full building-sized billboard of Eric, you know, hanging off the side of a nice waterfall. So I told him the story of Eric. He said, I got to film him. And I said, well, he's going to be at my house in three weeks at this CEO thing. And uh, why don't you just come out there? And so he brought his crew out there. He filmed them at this thing. And uh, uh, they uh, interviewed me, interviewed Eric, filmed him skiing, talked about his life. And uh, so when they got done, his producer said, well, I think, uh, I think we should submit this for the, uh, the Emmy Awards. And I'm thinking, you know, I mean, I didn't even think about it. I thought every producer probably says that about every project they ever do, right? And, uh, and so uh, I you know, didn't even think about it. So we finished this up. It turns out you know, it, it was pretty cool. It played, I don't know, 20,000 times or something on TV. And, um, and, uh, and so uh, I got a call from Fran. He said, Greg, we're going to submit that. I said, OK. He said, do you want to go to the Emmys? I said, of course not. Uh, um, I, he, sa he said, well, I said, how many are submitted in the category? He said, like 17 or something like that. And I said, great. So I, again, I didn't tell Eric. I didn't even think about it. You know, I just said, yeah, this is wishful thinking of, uh, you know, of a 70-year-old guy. And uh, and uh, uh, and lo and behold, uh, uh, they they had the ceremony. I didn't, didn't hear anything about it because I wasn't paying attention. And so a couple weeks later, Fran said, hey, I'd like to do dinner in New York. And he, I said, great. So he and his producer came to dinner, it was Rhonda and I, my wife and I, and they had this box. I thought they'd just been shopping. And then at dessert, they pull out these two Emmys, one for Eric and one for me. <laughs> and they said, we won. So uh, I, uh, I kind of hooked him up and did about a 30 second interview. And that was it. So I was the like, I was like the, your kid when they're a participant on the soccer team. But, 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 uh, but anyway, that's something you didn't know. That's cool. Yeah. I've, never, <laughs> I've never known an Emmy Award winner. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I hadn't either, by the way. So. Um. <laughs> If there are no other questions, Greg, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, uh, sure. Well, hey, thanks for, thanks for coming out. I do hope you get a chance, and, and I hope you enjoy it if you do, to, uh, to read the book. I, uh, I think the most interesting piece of the whole thing is actually, uh, is actually the life uh, plan. And maybe I can just take a second and kind of run through the corollary. So if you remember on the, on the uh, five steps on the business side, it was have a plan and track your progress. On the life side, it's really... Uh, uh, develop, you know, uh, simplify your life with some simple rules. And I don't know how many of you play poker, but one of the exercises I like to go through is talk about red chips, white chips, and blue chips. You know, white chips are a buck, red chips 10 bucks, blue chips 25 bucks. When I go through my life and I make my to-do list for what I got to get done, and I look at it, I guarantee you it's all white chips, right? It's stuff I got to get done the next day, week, month, whatever. I carry a pretty aggressive to-do list. Um, and, uh, but none of it is really all that important. So one of the things I reversed out is uh, when I wrote my life plan is I, I basically said, I need to actually write down what's really important to me, not what, uh, 
not what I'm ticking off my list and checking it off every day. I don't know if any of you have that problem too of just trying to get through. You know, a day will go by, a week, a month, and we'll realize all we've done is scratch off these, you know, things. I just move mine to the yeah, other yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rewrite them so it feels like you yeah. got them done or something. But, but, but um, uh, so I actually took time and actually used the format of Faith, Family, Friends, Fitness, Finance, basically five Fs. And uh, I wrote that a one-page plan for my life. So I give you kind of the faith example. Uh, I decided for the faith piece that I wanted to become an intimate of God's. A.W. Tozer is a famous theologian, says God doesn't have favorites, but he does have intimates. So then I just wrote down what are the things I would do, right, to do that, right, in order if that was to be accomplished. And I just look at that every, uh, you know, every uh, week. I carry it in my briefcase, basically, and, and I study it to make sure that as I'm, you know, going through life, I'm actually focused on what in the end is going to be a eulogy virtue, not a resume virtue. It was build a fortress balance sheet and... Uh, in, uh, in business, uh, for the financial side, uh, in life, it's, I just say, uh, I choose freedom, basically. Money can either be a wonderful servant or a relentless master. Set up your personal life and your personal financial situation so that you can execute on your life plan. It's, you know, there's a lot more to it, but you know, it's to go quickly. And then in, remember in business, it was think money in, not money out. How do I generate revenue? You know, uh, you know, Continental Gordon used to have a saying, you can make a pizza so cheap nobody wants to eat it. You know, what kind of things would people value if you put, you know, if you put on them? In life, it's the opposite. It's think money out, not money in. There are 13 major worldviews in the world. Uh, you know, atheism, agnostic, Christian, Islam, Jewish, I mean, you can keep going. Uh, the only thing every one of those agrees on is that we ought to pay alms to the poor, essentially do stuff for people less fortunate than us. Generosity is the only cure for materialism. So it's think money out not money in. In the book, by the way, I went out and interviewed, not for the book, but for my own sanity, I interviewed uh, about 12 billionaires that I thought had done a really great job of this, kind of like my Uncle Lyle. And I got their best practices, um, uh, what to do with your kids, what to do with your grandkids. I had a series of questions I, I wanted for myself. There's some great lessons learned in, in the book, so if you get to read it, you can, you can do that. And then in the business, remember we said build a team, clean house if necessary. In life, I actually found that if I wanted to execute the plan I had with my blue chips, I needed to think about who I surrounded myself with, right? The kinds of people I interacted with. And you cannot use this on your mother-in-law, by the way, but, 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 but I found that there was, uh, there's always somebody in your life that, at least for me, that was taking like 80% of the time and had 5% of the value add. And I realized if they had 5% of the value added for me, I probably had 5% of the value add for them. And so I said, you, you don't really get rid of them as friends, but you just move them from somebody you deal with every day to a concentric circle out, like once a month or once a year. Um, and, uh, and so, but you need the team that helps you do that. And then uh, uh, the last one, if you think about it, was let the inmates run the asylum. In life, it's really invest in family and friends. And the last story I'll tell you, and then I'll, I'll, I'll close, is uh, Britt Harris. Britt is the CIO of Texas Teachers. Uh, which is the, uh, the third largest pension fund in the country, provides the retirement for the teachers of the state of Texas. Um, Britt is an amazing guy. So he was the CEO of Bridgewater, the lar world's largest hedge fund. Very successful guy. He kind of went through a midlife reprioritization of what he wanted to do. And he said, if I really wanted to give back, my mom was a school teacher in Texas. And I would actually go manage their retirement. So they had a great retirement. Well, he's been there about 10 years, and they've had about a three or 400 basis, he's one of the top five investors in the world ranked. He, they've had about a four or 500 basis point, uh, you know, uh, uh, return above any other pension fund. So, I mean, their returns are out of, out of this world, uh, you know, based on what Britt's done. Uh, but he actually went a step further than that. He graduated, he was an Aggie, he graduated from A&M, and uh, he said, I'd really like to pour back into young people. So he started a class at A&M called Titans of Investing. Some of you may have heard of this class. But um, it's actually been studied by Harvard and Yale and Stanford and, and all sorts of other folks. And it's about half kind of off of Benjamin Franklin's Junto model. Uh, it's half kind of an investment class. And he does it for free. He bought a house there so the kids could use the house and all this stuff. But, but uh, and about, it's about half a life skills class. So he has a whole, his largest attended class is one on uh, courtship. How do you court? Which is really interesting. So it's about half. He's like ma a combination of your... Uh, of Heydrich and Struggles at Match.com, right? So, so uh, basically, but he actually knows, so he's been doing this, this season, his 22nd semester, 
11 years, 20 kids a year, 600 kids apply to, the, to get in the class. So it's a usually demanded class. He knows where every single student is, what they're doing, wow. what their family is for 11 years. He threatens he's going to flip a switch and take over the world, which is a little optimistic. But it's just a point of like, if you're investing in a eulogy virtue and you think about mentorship and giving back, there's some great examples out there of people that have really done an yeah. incredible job. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, but that's it. I know we said no more questions, but David, do we have time for one more? Go ahead, Bill. You okay with that? Yeah, sure. This is an interesting question. It's about what, what advice would you give to the millennials as they take over our mantles? Yeah. And, and how are they going to build from, from here? You know, I think in many ways the millennials have a, uh, 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 they have a deep sense of community and a purpose, uh, you know, which is kind of encouraging in a way. I mean, we were raised much more, at least I was, much more, uh, you know, task oriented. And, and they're, they're raised a little bit more relationally oriented. But, uh, you know, I think if there's kind of any piece of advice I'd have is life's a journey. Don't get in a hurry. And by the time they're actually uh, at the end of their life, the lifespan's probably going to be 100 years, right? So you got a while. Um, you know, the one thing, you know, we notice is, you know, the, uh, it, it, the, there's been, and we've created this. So, you know, our generation has created this, my generation. Uh, um, but there's a little bit of, we kept these kids so busy when they were young. We, we grew up like working, right? They grew up actually going to like soccer things and baseball things and ballet and you know whatnot. And they were super scheduled. Then they were helped to kind of get into the right grade school, the right high school, the right college. And they were pretty well programmed, right, for their whole life. So when we get them at, 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 as an employer, a lot of times what happens is uh, they really Unless, if you're telling them what to do, they know exactly what to do. But if, there, if it requires some amount of creativity or, uh, you know, find the next thing to do, uh, not so good at that. So I think, uh, you know, my encouragement would be slow down, take a deep breath. It's going to be a long life. Build your <laughs> skills. Uh, build your skill set up. Be willing to be apprenticed. Be willing to be mentored. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, think of your life as a 100-year career. Uh, that'd be my, my advice, because sometimes you can sort of think you ought to be CEO in a week, and that's not going to really happen, yeah, probably. That's probably what wouldn't want. be good for you or Would you mind talking people. to my children, please? Yeah, yeah, no. I have, I have well, kids, too. I have millennials, too. So. Well, yeah. it's a fascinating story. Yeah. Thank you. Great Thank to you. see you Thanks, again. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.